Claude Stanley Malone, first of the, born 1st of the 949. Uh, my service number is 1202577. I was a sapper in the Royal Australian Engineers Unit, where I served in Townsville in, uh, what was it, 18 Field Squadron, and in Brisbane, 24 Construction Squadron. Uh, this is in 1968, I think, 68 or 69. One of the reasons I joined the army was to get out of Sherbet because we was underpaid there. For, they, they call it stolen wages. And it's one of the reasons why I left there because when I left high school, I was working for you know, no, about thirty dollars a fortnight or something, and I had to pay board to my parents and that. So I joined the army to get more money and to help them out too. My parents out. Uh, I was in. The, they call it the trade train. It's like a, we used to make furniture for other communities in Queensland, and. Uh, they call it the uh, Trade Training Centre. And that's about it. We made uh, furnitures for like sinks and cupboards and everything like that for other communities around Queensland. First uh, recruit training, of my first year was at, down at Wagga Wagga. They call it K Kapuka. Is that in Wagga Wagga? Then uh, core, my core training was in Sydney and uh, at Liverpool, Kashula really, but it's right near Liverpool there. Eh? And from there, when they, they sent me to, from when I finished core training, they sent me to Townsville, then down to Brisbane and Vietnam, then back to Brisbane. Eh? They just call you in the office, tell you, your number's up, you go on over. Don't give you a warning or nothing. Especially the regulars, the uh, national servicemen, they knew where they was going, but they never told us regulars. We, they, you only find out when you go into the office, when the the officer in charge calls you in, says, pack your bags, go on for an holiday. I was told by the recruiting officer that I was, wasn't going there. The war will be finished by the time I finished my court training and everything. I was told a lie. I told my parents that and they, you know, said, they said good because they knew what was going on see it on the news and that, and they didn't want, me, didn't want me to go. And I was told by the recruiting officers, uh, you'll be, they'll be over by the time you finish your recruit training. Yes, and I had a friend there, and uh, plus my, I had blokes there before me uh, from Sherbury, there was a couple corporals in my unit who told me about it and that, what, 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 what to expect in it. There was, uh, was Glenn Brown and uh, Peter Eggerty. They're both from Sherbury, and they explained to me what, what, what would happen over there, what I'd be doing and that. Was a pretty good thing before I went over there, see. Luck, when I joined the army, I didn't think I'd be a couple of Sherbeck blokes be in charge of me, you know, from my own community. But I was lucky I had two of them who looked after me and everything while I was in the army there, in the unit. Then plus I uh, had another mate over there at the time, um, Eric Law, his name. He was there and, and, I, got, and I met a couple of blokes there one from Iswell, he's, he's, uh, he used to come over to Sherbeck 
Years ago, when we were small, there used to be a sheer big show, it was, annual show. And I got to know him, and he, and, uh, and about when I came back, his daughter and my son started seeing each other, and this one thing I said, is your daughter named Jade? And he said, yeah. And, and your son named Darren? I said, yeah. <laughs> and, well, what, what's going on? He said, no, they've seen each other. And nine kids later, <laughs> yeah. we, we couldn't believe it. You know, we're pretty close now. Like he, last time I seen him, he came to my 70th birthday. I see him all the time. And we went home for my 70th birthday and he came from Iceball over to celebrate with me. And it was pretty, we are pretty close. Or going down, they used to call us tunnel rats. There's bunker systems underneath. I used to do that, go down, and they stopped that then. Because, you know, what's the use? Did they, we used to just blow the entrance or the exits. Yeah, because it's too dangerous. And he sent you down with a 45. There's a big bunker system, hospital underneath. Uh, like uh, housing where they a battalion slept and all that. That pretty, you know, Chloe, the Viet Cong, the Vietnamese, uh, they had everything underneath, underground. And this was their job to find them. I didn't know that. In the dark, you got the torch and the four to five. That's like a pea shooter. We had to go search the bodies. Like one, I had to go and see five bodies. Uh, they left overnight and they generally put uh, booby traps on them, underneath them, like a, a grenade or something on the body and pull the pin. And when you pull the body away, it explodes and they, they pretty, you know, you have to be very careful and you have to go with you just to bane it. And search around the body in the area, look for wires or anything like that. Wasn't, wasn't, oh, it's hard to explain, yeah. Set up an ambush, a couple of v VCs walking through the jungle, where we'd set, on the, we'd find out where the tracks are and wait for them. And a couple of times there, we caught about four, four, four blokes walking through, you know, and once I was on the machine gun, I was uh, second on the machine gun, and uh, we got four kills. The, the bloke was on it, we asked to feed the ammo, and that's when I got four kills. And uh, yeah, it wasn't pretty or anything, but it's a job we sent there to do, and you had to do it. No questions asked. Otherwise, it's your life in danger. Yeah. You go down to a place called Wang Tao, it's like on the beach. Like a beach, they got a, a, a hotel there on the beach and that, and where, where you stay in that for, for us, for the Australians, and they get all, all the other countries who, they, who was there. And, you had separate one, but our Australian one there. Pretty good. We only got four days to wind in. But a couple of times I ran into Eric while I was there, and all we talked about, got a few beers and just talked about home, Sherberg. Yeah. When you do go down, you do like going. Most of them go and surf, but I don't like surfing or anything like that. Um, fresh water, I don't like to. Yeah. And uh, it mainly just hang around the pool area, drinking and swimming. I was supposed to go to uh, Taiwan for R&R, &R, 
but they pulled us out. Pulled my unit out I was in. I would have loved to go you know, there for a week, I think it was, I don't know, six days, Taiwan, yeah, Taipei, yeah. but never got that, never got to see there, see Taiwan. They started shifting us back home when I was there. Towards the end of the tour of Vietnam, they started pulling the troops out, and I was lucky then. They pulled us out, our unit out, and, and we ended up in Sydney. And uh, they sent me back to Brisbane, and uh, I had enough. And really, uh, the war got to me, you know, and sort of, well, I wanted out. I couldn't handle it anymore, uh, mentally, really. Yeah, that's why I got out. I remember when I came back, when I, was, I posted back to Brisbane there, there was a lot of, there was a community where I started, I, seen, I was seeing a girl, that was Darren's mother in there. She lived in Anala. And there was a lot of, there's a big Vietnamese community there, there people there. And I, it didn't go down well with me at first, you know, seeing them in there. They're building up shops and that, and we had nothing and all that, you know. Didn't like it a bit, and because I went to war there, I didn't like it either, you know. Didn't like it at all. And uh, but over the years, I, see, I seemed to, you know, accept them, and then start to accept them a bit. But it was hard at first when I first went to Anala, seeing Vietnamese there. You know? It was a bit hard to, to take, you know. Yeah. You feel like doing something. I get put, doing something bad to them, but I sort of held my own because I met a couple of blokes there, Aboriginal blokes too, who lived there and all at the time. I got to know them well, and they they felt the same way like me. Them coming over here making all the, making themselves rich and, you know, shops and that, opening up shops and that. And we, Aboriginal people, especially us Aboriginal people over there at the time, suffering, you know, because of, uh, because, I don't know, it's pretty hard to explain, you know. We've suffered a lot over the years with the government and that. And um, that's, what was, that's, like I said before, that one of the reasons I joined the army is to, for, because of stolen wages, the government gave us nothing, really. Yeah. And uh, stolen wages, stolen generation, they, they, everything that had happened to us. Didn't like it one bit. But when a couple of times there, when we had contact, they call it contact, fire contact, you know, who they sent first? Us. It happened to me a couple of times. And, and I, I don't like to say this, but they found out I came from Cherbourg because of stolen wages and that and I got less than what the white soldiers got. And they're still fighting for it today. My, I didn't know about it until my mate there in there from Oswald, Steve Collins, he told me about it. Did you check up about that? Because I got my stolen wages from Sherberg there. They paid me back, but not enough, you know. Yeah. But I only got about 20,000 back, and that's nothing what they should have gave me. He asked me if I got them back from the army. I said, no. Nah. I said, I didn't even know about it. He's the one who told me. And uh, he said, uh, he's fixing up everything and he haven't got back to me yet. And like I say, you know, we suffer a lot. You just gotta live with it.
That's the way I look at it anyway. Well, what we found out, and that when they when they walking through the town, they got their headphones on and they're smoking marijuana or something. Like they get more kills with friendly fire than what the enemy. Think. I think that's what a lot of people, a lot of us, our, our mates said. You know, they killed by their own and friendly fire. They were so. Ugh. You can't explain them there, what they do. Like, I used to work a lot with uh, the Maoris, the Kiwis. They just sent us out because they had no engineers over there, field engineers, like do the mines and all that. They used to send us out, and I used to go a lot. And the Maori fellas, they used to cook up big. I said, why you do that? You only bringing the enemy in. I said, we want them to come. I said, yeah, you Yes, right, old brothers. <laughs> we used to call it his bro and all that, you know. But said, we want them to come. And us Australians, we used to keep our feed down low, you know, food. Don't cook a big or anything, just a cup of tea or something, eat from the can and that. They cook a big, they want like big onion or something. I said, aren't you afraid? They said, no, we want them to come. <laughs> Uh, a couple of times it happened to me with them. I used to go out a lot with them, you know. And my bunch of good blokes, they, you know, they know how to out handle themselves, look after themselves. That was one of the best things that happened to me over there, going with them. Yeah, a couple of blokes, they're probably from New South Wales, uh, who used to, well, they, I think there was a couple from New South Wales, we used to call them Curry, you see. We're Murrays, Queensland Murrays, we call them Murray. And they call Curries and from Western Australia, they are Noongars. New South Wales and Victoria, and that's again, we call them Curries. Yeah, I met a couple of them, but never got in touch after. We just went our ways. Just uh, only block here, like two blokes. Eric Law and uh, Steve Collins. It was pretty bad, because you know, I remember coming back from Vietnam in, in Brisbane Airport there, and there was uh, demonstrators there, you know, calling us baby killers and everything. And that one woman, she walked up to me when I was get, walking out to get in the cab. She called me a baby killer, and, she spat on me. Well, I put her on her ass, you know. Being over there and coming back and copping all this shit here in, in Australia. I just hit her and that's it. And the coppers grabbed me. I thought, oh, oh, yeah, I'm gone. But they took me straight to the taxi, put me in there. Where are you going? I said, South Brisbane Station, catch a bus home to Sherberg. Yeah. Like I said, you know, my parents never pressured me and telling me, asking me things and that, and even my, my seven sisters and they they tried to ask me and two brothers, they you know I wouldn't tell them nothing. I sort of kept it in the chest and you know, then didn't want to say anything. I was suffering a lot too, you know, deep down. Plus, uh, I started getting all the skin rashes and that from, they called it the Agent Orange, and I started getting rashes and that. It, well, it, it affected me later in life. Uh, two hip replacement uh, joints, two knee replacement, two shoulders. Arthritis, that said in that it causes arthritis, that Agent Orange. They try to say it's, the government try to say it's another thing. They call it psoriasis. But I was over at the Greenslow's Hospital, I was there with, in the, in the ward, they wear skin, you know? And my skin disease was different to them, they called psoriasis. It affected my joints. Like my 
I can hardly do my hands. I used to be good with uh, boxing and then cricket bat. Yeah, that was pretty good. I can hardly hold a bat now. Uh, and rugby league, football, I was, can hardly hold a ball to pass it. Yeah, I like to, I like to go out and teach my grandkids in there, but I can't do it. Uh, what only kept me going when I came back, I was a uh, inaugural there. The um, couple of my nephews, they was playing for the Aboriginal side football, uh, rugby league, and they come and I see. I always stayed in camp at Inogra. I never used to go out anyway because I, I just got back from Vietnam and I was, didn't want to do anything. They asked me to go and play, join the club there, you know. I said, I'll give it a go. Started, started going there, started playing sport again then. Rugby league and that was the first team and we, we started a second team then in the eighties. And I started to get back to get back into life again. Through sports and I ended up doing well and I ended up coaching there in the eighties for in the the old black side, we call ourselves Brisbane Natives. And yeah, and in the 80s, uh, we get eight premierships. I won, uh, made, made the finals about 10 times, I think. Yeah, and got beaten twice, twice in the final, one eight. Uh, that helped me a lot, playing sport again, you know. Because when I came back, I didn't run into that. If it weren't for my nephews who come in, asked me to, you know, you know, they knew how good I was and that, and they asked me. And I said, yeah, okay then. I even tried out for the big, big clubs in Brisbane here. They, they, they disbanded now, they, they call themselves Brothers, Brothers Rugby League Football Club. And uh, I tried there with them, but like typical blokes from Sherbrooke, they like their sports, but don't like training. That's one of the things we used to laugh about. That yeah, we loved our sports and that, but training, nah. <laughs> My mother used to tell me that I used to have nightmares. I used to sing out, you know, call out in the dark and be screaming in the dark and that, have not having nightmares. And she said, come wake, uh, she said, never used to wake me. She said, leave me going, but just watch me. And I used to go off to sleep. And well, they told her that, that, well, they used to tell all that, mothers and that, of soldiers coming back from Vietnam, I think that they will suffer nightmares and that at some stage of our lives. And, uh, and uh, well, it happened to me and they told it, they told them mothers and that don't wake them or anything like that. They'll probably go back to sleep or something like that. Well, that's what used to happen to me. My mother used to tell me and I don't, can't remember a thing. What happened, you know? Blank in my mind, yeah, yeah. I didn't think I'd do that, be, because I heard about other blokes and that, having same nightmares and that thing, and I didn't think it had happened to me, but it did. I, uh, when I hit about, it started to get in my late 40s and that, I started to suffer a lot, you know, sickness and that, in and out. My joints and uh, plus the rashes as well as in and out of the hospital. Because I just, you know, wish the government that look at it, 
look at it and stop sending young people to war. This one, I went, they sent me over, they asked me to talk over at uh, the youth detention center there. I went there and I, it's not right. Like, I couldn't explain myself when I come back because I was, well, I, it sort of hit me and, and I, I didn't know what, what happened to my years over there. It's, uh, it's hard to explain, you know, going to war and coming back and now nah, I just, just can't explain it really. Yeah. Because I, I wish I could, but I, I, myself, I sort of you know, just didn't want to talk about it or in, have anything to do with that, that part of my life. That, that, but the 11 months I spent over there, 10, 11 months here yeah, over there, Vietnam, I didn't want to try to forget it, but it comes back. Aren't you at times, you know? I just want to forget all that, whatever happened, that uh, happened to me over there. That's all I can say about it. Uh, I try to say, to tell the young people, don't join, because I had a young, couple of young nephews looking to join the army, and I told them, they're no good for you. Didn't ever gave him a reason or anything. I said, no, it's not good for you. Because I didn't want him to go, go over anywhere and suffer like I did. I, I reckon after Vietnam, we shouldn't go, you know. Like, go anywhere, like, I got a treaty with America, right, Australia. I think everywhere that America could go, Australia could go, to, uh, how you put it, their, their treaty, to honor the treaty they are with, to go, if they, like, if they didn't go to Vietnam, we wouldn't have went there. Like, Iraq and all that, the Americans went there, they, you know, well, Australia had to go there. It's the war there. That, they shouldn't send young kids, especially young kids, 19, 20 year old, lucky I was 21, I think, when I went to Vietnam. And there was blokes 19 year old and that. Sent kids from National Service straight out of high school or whatever. It wasn't, it's not right. You know, sending, like any war's not right, you know. I don't, you know, that opened my eyes, Vietnam opened my eyes, you know. Shouldn't have any war in there, anywhere. That's one thing I, my grandkids, and that, they, uh, they ask us questions, like they, the other pop too, you know. They got two Vietnam veterans, my grandkids. Uh, on the mother's side, that's Steve Collins. My son, Darren, he wanted to join the army. But straight out, no. I told him, no, no, I don't know, I want you to. After what I've been through and that. They promise you the world. It's all lies. And said, being black, being an Aboriginal, that's the worst thing you can do. You're fighting for your country. You still don't get the respect. Well, I found that out the hard way. And I'm not racist or anything. You know? that's, why I, that's why I told my son, no way. I don't want you to join. He wanted to join the army. When I stopped playing sports and all that, I sort of went back to my old ways staying by myself and I just worrying about my family, my grandkids and all that. And uh, uh, like I hardly go out now. Go anywhere. And I used to go, when I was younger, I used to go out a lot drinking and that. I stopped drinking, smoking. Uh, 
I used to be a, I was a pretty heavy drinker and smoker when I come back from Vietnam. I didn't, I was, didn't even touch beer or smoke before I went over there. Because I remember one block that we got into contact then, bullets flying in, and he just lighting up smoke. And I said, what's that bloody doing for you? Putting there, put, you know? Putting, putting us away, smoke coming out. He said, no, nah, that's calm my nerves. I said, well, give me one then. From then on, I started smoking. Hmm. Eric started up in Sherbrooke there. I promised my parents I'll come home, there. I'll go home every year. And I haven't missed it since I started back there, since I started it up. Got a new um, monument and all that there and there. It's pretty good now there and there. I go back home every year. And it's one thing, you know, I promised my parents I'll do that. And, it's there. and Eric, he, you know, pretty good. He, he asked me if I want to go and say anything off the mic and that. So now I leave that all to you. You're the, you're, you're the one with the big mouth. He don't like it either. <laughs> we, we had a tougher life in the army as Aboriginals. I don't know if it's starting to get better or what now. But going back, you know, the white and black Australian, going back in the years and that, because our diggers in World War One and World War Two and that. They couldn't even go in the pub and have a drink with their white mates. And that's wrong. They give their giving their lives together together on a battlefield and they still can't even drink together. There's something wrong there. That's why I, that's why I hardly talk about it, you know? It's the way the government treat us. Uh, and I, I leave it at that. <laughs>